We are starting right now. So let's all stand. Let's face toward Jerusalem. Brothers, uncover your heads. Sisters, cover your head in respect to God as we open up. Go ahead, bro. Our Father which art in heaven. Our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Be thy, name. Thy, kingdom come. thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth, thy will be done in earth. As, it in as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us of our debts. As we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Praise the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord God of Israel, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. The Alpha and the Omega, the, Alpha and Omega. the beginning and the end, the, and the, end. The, King the King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. Lord of Lords. In, Jesus name, In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times. Ye people, pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. Shalah. Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Trust not in opposition, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. God has spoken once, twice, have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou rendereth to every man according to his works. This scripture reading came from Psalms 62, verses 5 through 12. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearing, reading, and doing of his word, in Jesus' mighty work, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. All right, now we're going to have a selection from the adult choir. Test one. Give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you. 
can use me, yeah. Give myself away. I give myself away. Give myself away. So you, so you can use I give myself away. Give myself away. Oh. Break every chain, break every chain, break every 
Give it up for King, y'all. Give it up for the choir. Praise the Lord. Check, check. All right, y'all. Let's get a choir another round of applause. <laughs> Praise the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Peace to everybody that's here. Peace to everybody that's watching on the internet and listening on the phone line, if we have the phone line up. All right. I am going to go. You know what? I'm not going to do the Sabbath disclaimer today because I have a section in this lesson that specifically deals with the Sabbath. No need to deal with that. I'm going to deal specifically, well, I'm going to deal with the multiple response strategies, and then I'm going to get into the lesson. We got a lot of ground to cover, all right? Uh, if you guys understand the concepts during this lesson, what do you do? Thumbs up. I clearly understand the concept. If you do not understand the concept, what do you do? I don't understand the concept. This is not clear to me. If you kind of understand the concept, what do you do? To the side with a jiggle. I like interacting with people. I want to make sure you guys understand what's going on and that you guys get it, all right? I'm not talking to cameras. I'm making eye contact with people, individuals, right? <laughs> all right, that being said, the lesson, the psychosis of the curses and the cure. This lesson was actually sparked by it kind of evolved over, I want to say, a three or four month time frame. There's entirely too much rhetoric going on in the echo chamber. In other words, loose talk, loose commentary about our people's conditions from people that, honestly, I don't think is qualified to speak on our condition. So part of this lesson is if you're having dialogue with someone and they're asking you about our conditions as a people, why do black people do this? Why do black people do this? Why are there so many shootings? This is so you can have a, an educated, clear response for them. Because sometimes if you want to go into the Bible, they become dismissive. Some people do not attribute you know, the holiness and reverence the Bible like we do. They become dismissive. These are arguments that are based on immutable facts, empirical immutable facts in the world. Now, when you couple that with what's said in the Bible, it's irrefutable. So this dialogue is for that, all right? To deal with other nations when they ask us questions. It's to qualify, do they care? Or are they just trying to use this to impute their prejudices? This is what this is to deal with. Second part is so we as a people can have a catharsis and understand truly that even though Chattel slavery is over, we're still captives. And the problem is in our minds, we think that because Chattel slavery is over, that we should have the same rights as everyone. And while I agree we should have the same rights as everyone, truly the struggle is something different. So without further ado, and me flapping, because I don't like to flap, let's get into it. The psychosis from the curses and the cure. We're going to Proverbs 3. Y'all know how I like to do it. I like to set the tone. Proverbs 3. When you pre present these facts, I actually had a conversation, several conversations with Gentiles, and I just presented several of these facts. And at the end of one of the conversations with a very conservative Gentile, older conservative gun toting Gentile, he said to me, I understand a little bit more why your people feel like outsiders in this system. This is what this is for, to have that dialogue. 
unemotionally, of course. Now, I know y'all gonna be kind of, y'all gonna be mad in here, but let's try not to be emotional when we deal with other nations. Let's just put the facts on the table. These are the facts, immutable, empirical, in, immutable and empirical facts. Proverbs 3, one verse. We setting the tone right now. Let you know what we're dealing with. I got a little reverb in me, man. Take the Reby Jackson out of me, please. Proverbs 3, and I'm a little unorthodox with my teaching style. Sometimes I'll reference movies or a song. <laughs> Don't let that throw you off. Proverbs 3, we're going 3, one verse, verse 33. Proverbs 3, one verse, verse 33. Go ahead, my brother. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesses the inhabitation of the just. So it says the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. This is what we're talking about, the blessings and the curses and the mental psychological effects of those curses over time with our people. This is what this is all about. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy 28. 3,425 years ago, the God of Israel said this about our mindset. 3,425 years ago, the Lord said we were going to be dealing with this as a mindset. There's a lot of implication, implications with the curses. Deuteronomy 28, one verse. Verse 28. Go ahead, my brother. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. So we're talking the Lord saying he would be directly responsible for us having madness, blindness, and astonishment of the heart. The heart is the mind. So he said we were going to feel how we feel. This is supernatural. But there's conditions that evoke this response. Now, let's get the definition of madness. Definition of madness. Right here. Tell them the source, and then give us the definition, please. Go ahead, bro. Definition of madness. The quality or state of being mad such as a state of severe mental illness. A state of severe mental illness. Madness, blindness, and astonishment of heart, and the definition of madness is severe mental illness. Go ahead, sir. Behavior or thinking that is very foolish or dangerous. Stop. Behavior or thinking that is very foolish and dangerous. Go ahead, sir. Extreme folly, an idea that is pure. Sheer madness. Come on. Intense anger, rage. So this is what the Lord said we were going to feel like, and this is how our mindset was going to operate because of what we deal with in the world, because of these curses. Now, I'm going to introduce a word to you. It's called it's, it's psychosis, okay? Give me the definition of psychosis, please. And this comes from mentalhealth.net, all right? And the first one was uh, merriamswebster.com, dictionary. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, man. Psychosis. 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 Yes. Is a general term to describe a set of symptoms of mental illness that result in strange or bizarre thinking, perceptions, sight, sound, behavior, and emotion. Stop. Bizarre thinking or perceptions or sight and sound. It's a, it's a, it's a word that describes mental illness. Go ahead, sir. Psychosis is a brain-based condition that is made better or worse by environmental factors. It is made better or worse by environmental factors. Environmental factors contribute to the psychosis. Go ahead, sir. Like drug use and stress. Now let's get back to the Bible. So we got a condition that's called psychosis that affects you according to your environment or the stressors that you have in your environment. I propose we have a generational trauma induced psychosis. We have a generational trauma-induced psychosis as a people because of what we're about to read, because of the conditions of our environment. Let's go to Deuteronomy 28. This is, this is an oldie but goodie. Y'all know it, but we're about to really delve in and see why our mindset is the way it is. So when people impute these things to us, like it's just like we just woke up over here and one day we, we were wherever we were and then we just woke up in America, or I'm sorry, woke up in the Western Hemisphere and we're crazy. No, there are conditions 
of our environment that create this, that God said we would have. Deuteronomy 28. We're going 15 through 20, we're going to dance. Go ahead, bro. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Come on. That all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Come on. Cursed shall thou be in the city, and cursed shall thou be in the field. Stop. Can you guys hear him okay? Yeah. Mike, uh, Mark, we need to turn his mic up because we can't hear him. And y'all need to hear him. Go ahead, bro. Cursed shall thou be, cursed shall be thy basket in thy store. More. Turn his mic up more, please. Cursed shall be the, the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land. Stop. Turn his mic up more. Go ahead. The increase of thy, of, of thy kind. Thank you. And thy flocks and thy sheep. Now, stop. Start at Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. Please, go ahead, sir. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Come on. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou, shalt thou be in the field. Are curses good or bad? bad. Are curses bad or horrible? Our curse is terrible. Yes. Come on. Curse shall be thy basket and thy store. So whatever business you got, you got a problem. Come on. Curse shall be the fruit of thy body. That's your children. Come on. And the fruit of thy land. Come on. The increase of thy kind, kin, and the flocks of thy sheep. Come on. Curse shalt thou be when thou comest in, and curse shalt thou be when thou goest out. So no matter where you come, you don't know if you're coming or going because you curse when you come in or going. Go ahead, sir. The Lord shall send upon thee cursings, vexations, and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. Skip to verse 25. So far, this doesn't sound good. This is the environment that we're going to live in and have to endure as a people. This is the environment that is causing the psychosis, generational trauma. Go ahead, sir. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go, go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. What does removed mean? Taken away. That does not mean voluntary. That does not mean you get on a boat or whatever and you go of your own volition. No, that means you are forced, removed into all the kingdoms of the earth, not just Europe, all the kingdoms of the earth. Go ahead, sir. And thy carcass shall be meat unto all fowls of the air and unto the beast of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. Do slaves or so-called freshly freed slaves have proper burials? I'm asking a question. Do slaves have proper burials? Do birds like strange fruit? Birds like strange fruit. It's a song about us hanging from trees. Go ahead, sir. Skip to 28. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. Come on. And thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness. You're going to be... Lord, they say you're going to be searching for something with a flashlight in the, in, the, in the day, whatever that saying is. That's what this is saying. We're going to be groping in the middle of the day, trying to find something, anything. Go ahead, sir. And thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. Skip to verse 32. Go ahead, sir. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thine hand. Now, if someone's taking your child away from you, and you can't do anything about it, will you recover from that quickly? No. Probably not. Would you be ruined for some, some, some long time, right? And then on top of that, after your child is sold away from you, what do you have to do the next day? Get back in that field. Go ahead, sir. And there shall be no might in thine hand. Come on. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up. And thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always. Only oppressed and crushed. Only oppressed and crushed. I'm sorry. Does anyone in here sometimes feel oppressed and crushed? Yes. 
and discouraged. This is the environment that is fostering our psychosis. I'm going to prove it in a moment. Go ahead, sir. So that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes, which, shalt, which thou shalt see. 34 again, sir. So that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. He said, because you're going to be oppressed and crushed always, you're going to be mad because of the things that you see in your environment. The effects of the curses has caused complex post-traumatic stress syndrome. Let's get the definition, or should I say, yeah, let's read the definition of complex post-traumatic uh, post stress syndrome. You got that. Flip the whole, flip the stack of pages over. Not, yeah, don't worry about that. Flip the stack over, the whole stack. There you go. This is the effects of post-traumatic stress syndrome, or should I say complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Go ahead, sir. What's the source? Recognizing complex trauma, psychology today. Treating trauma is a task most therapists... Stop. Can you guys hear him? Maybe you ought to pull the mic up. Let's try it again. Recognizing complex trauma... Psychology Today. Stop. They still can't hear you. Mics up, please. I'm not playing today. Trust me when I tell you, I'm not playing today. Mics up, please, sir. Recognizing complex trauma. There we go. Psychology Today. Treating trauma is a task most therapists can expect to undertake in their career. In today's social and political climate, in which soldiers are continually being deployed to wars, to war zones, and the recent recession has been linked to an increase in child abuse. We can anticipate that many cases of complex trauma are sure to arise. Complex trauma is described by psychologists and trauma experts, Dr. Christine Cortois, as a type of trauma that occurs repeatedly and cumulatively. Cumulatively. So we're talking about a, a, a complex trauma that, are, that occurs repeatedly and cumulatively. Over a period of time, you experience the same trauma and conditions over and over again. All right? Go ahead, sir. Usually over a period of time and within specific relationships and contexts. Come on. Example includes severe child abuse, domestic abuse, or multiply military developments, de sorry, deployments into dangerous locals. Skip down to reading two. Section two, go ahead, sir. Repetitive, prolonged, or cum cumulative, most often interpersonal, involving direct harm, Ex exploitation, and maltreatment, including. Stop, start again. I want them to hear what we're talking about. I want them to hear what we're talking about. Go ahead, bro. Repetitive, prolonged, or cum cumulative. Two, most often interpersonal, involving direct harm, exploitation, and maltreatment. Maltreatment. Maltreatment, including neglect. So we're talking about relationships that are interpersonal, where you experience trauma or abuse or neglect or exploitation over and over again for a long extended period of time. Go ahead, sir. Abandonment. Antipathy by primary caregivers or other osten ostensibly, ostensibly. ostensibly responsible adults. So in other words, people that are supposed to care for you are the ones that are abusing you. In other words, the master owns you, the master wants you to work for him, and yet he abuses you. But you rely on him, but he abuses you, cumulatively and over an extended period of time. Go ahead, sir. Three, often occurs at developmentally vulnerable times in the victim's life, especially in early childhood or adolescence, but can also occur later in life and in conditions of vulnerability associated with disability. Disempowerment, dispensary, age, infirmity, and so on. Skip to section three. On September 24, I will host the GE, 
GE webinar, Complex Forms of Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, with Dr. Cordes in her article, Complex Trauma. Complex reactions, assessments, and treatments. She lists symptoms of complex PTSD. Now, as, these are the symptoms. Go ahead, sir. As including difficulty regulating effective impulsive, such as anger, and self-destructiveness. Read that again, please. Difficulty doing what? Difficulty regulating effective impulses, such as anger, and self-destructiveness. So a symptom of, how, of complex trauma is difficulty regulating your impulses when it comes to anger. Difficulties regulating how you feel. Go ahead, sir. Dissociative episodes and chronic sense of guilt or responsibility, difficulty trusting people or feeling intimate, hopelessness or despair. Hopelessness or despair. Problems with relationships. This is what we're talking about. This is based on madness, blindness, and groping in the day. Go ahead, sir. Verse, uh, uh, section four. Incidents of trauma, whether they occurred in a childhood, home, a war zone, or a POW or POW cell, can incite guilt in those impacted. Traumatized individuals may experience an altered self perception in stop the traumatized people experience an altered self perception a self perception that's not related or directly correlates with reality go ahead sir in which they suffer with feelings of intense shame they may experience severe guilt believing it is somehow their fault that that certain terrorizing events took place stop let that sit for a second if the Lord says your children are going to be taken away from you and there's nothing you can do, you're going to feel that you have something to do with that. It's going to affect you. Families being torn apart, it's going to affect you. Go ahead, sir. One painful identification people make when they are victims of abuse occurs when they internalize their aggressor. In other words, they may start to identify with the person who hurt them the most, sometimes feeling protective or taking on their destructive points of view towards themselves. In other words, you internalize, you internalize the point of view of your abuser. You start thinking what your abuser is telling you about you is actually true. More on that later on. Go ahead, sir. I often discuss the concept of the critical inner voice, a term my father, Robert Firestone, PhD, and I used, used to describe a negative self-perception we care with us in our minds. All of us possess this inner critic, but those of us who are traumatized may experience this voice as a deeply destructive and terrifying enemy. So the inner critic is telling you, you can't do anything, you can't accomplish anything. And then the, it alters your self-perception of yourself, not only yourself, but of the world around you. Go ahead, sir. Whose attack on us can feel crippling and constant and can lead to even life-threatening self-destruction behavior. Self-destructive behavior like shooting someone who looks like you. Go ahead, sir. When a person feels hopeless or isolated in their suffering or finds it difficult to trust easily, he or she can become further victimized by their critical inner voice. Come on. In turn, they may fail to have compassion for themselves and may make choices that repeat destructive patterns of their past. Stop. A person may fail to have compassion for themselves. If you don't have compassion from your, for yourself because you have an, alter, uh, an altered self-perception, guess what that's going to do? It's going to, it's going to affect everyone around you. Go ahead, sir. For instance, an abused child may wind up in an abusive, in an abusive relationship as an adult. Come on. It is essential for victims of trauma to find ways to differentiate from the negative programming they've received in moments of stress. In order to do so, they must be able to feel compassion for themselves and the intense emotional anguish they've endured. Complex trauma requires complex and sequence treatment, which involves multiple components that target the different symptoms that arise on the road to recovery. The good news is that treatment is available and research is helping to inform the development. Now, 
Does that sound like what we endure as a people psychologically? Because of what we deal with with these curses and our environment, this is what we have. Complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Let's get back to the book. Let's go to Deuteronomy 28. We back to the book. We dancing. Are you guys understanding the concept so far? Does it make sense? Should we tolerate people that actually have, that are not qualified to comment on our condition, to comment on our condition? I refuse. Yes, I understand what we need to do, but certain people are not to make loose comments on our condition. Deuteronomy 28, we're going 36 and 37. Deuteronomy 28, we're going 36 and 37. Go ahead, sir. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king, which thou, which thou set over thee, unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there shall they shall serve other gods, wood and stone. Come on. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, whither the Lord shall lead thee. Please read that again, sir. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, whither the Lord shall lead thee. A proverb and a byword. A proverb is a story. A byword is a name. I'm going to deal with the story that they tell us about us. I'm going to deal with the story that they tell us about us. And then I'm going to deal with the most famous <laughs> byword on the planet. Hmm. Go ahead, bro. Go to the uh, handout section. Now, the concept of race is completely er erroneous. It's a confabulation. Europeans made that up. Race does not exist. There are heritage groups. God deals with heritage groups, not race. I'm going to show you where race came from, how it became popularized, and then how it became weaponized to use against us to make us feel that our self-worth and our perception of ourselves, to make, it, to make our perception of ourselves the way it is now. Let's deal with where the concept of race came from. It came from Aristotle and Plato. Aristotle and Plato. First Plato. Go ahead, sir. This is from... Britannica.com, building the myth of black inferiority. A number of 18th century political and intellectual leaders began publicity to assert that Africans were naturally inferior and that they were indeed best suited for slavery. So you have some European cats telling you that you are suitable for slavery and that you are inferior just by how you look. Go ahead, sir. A few intellectuals revived an older image of all living things. The scala, natural Latin scale of nature, or great chain of being. Stop. This is the concept that Aristotle came with. It's called the great chain of being. The great chain of being is a hierarchical structure where it has God at the top and then everyone else underneath God. And the great chain of being, black people are the lowest of human beings on that hierarchical structure. That's Aristotle, that's Plato, that's where the modern, modern concept of race comes from, that thinking. Go ahead, sir. To demonstrate that nature or, or God had made men unequal, this ancient hierarchical, hierarch, hierarchical paradigm encompassing all living creatures started with the simplest organisms and reaching to humans, angels, and ultimately ultimately to God come on became for the advocates of slavery a perfect reflection of the realities of in unequally that they had created they created this I don't think y'all understand race does not exist that is a that is a confabulation that is something that is false it's a farce do not accept anyone telling you about race anymore God is with heritage groups correct them Remove that power from them. Go ahead, sir. The physical differences of blacks and Indians became the symbols or makers of their status. It was during these times that the term race became widely used to denote the ranking and equality, inequality of these peoples. Come on. In other words, their placement on the chain of being. Section two.
Enlightenment philosophers and systematics. The, the, the development of the idea and ideology of race coincided with the rise of science in America and European cultures. Come on. Much of the inspiration for the growth of science has been, has been credited to the period known as the Enlightenment. Come on. That spanned most of the 18th century. Many early Enlightenments, writers believed in the power of education and fostered very liberal ideas about the potenti potentiality of all people, even savages, for human progress. Yet later in the century, some of the earliest assertions about the natural inferiority, inferiority of Africans were published. Major proponents of the ideology of race inequality were the German philosophers, Immanuel Kant. So this is the, these are the progenitors of the modern philosophical movement that structured Western society. Go ahead, sir. And these are the same people that will tell you that you are inferior because of your race. Go ahead, sir. The French philosopher Valator. Voltaire. Voltaire. The Scottish philosopher and historian David Hume. And the influential American political philosopher Thomas Jefferson. Stop. Thomas Jefferson, one of the architects, the architect of the Declaration of Independence, was of this mindset that inferiority was given by God to men. I don't think y'all hearing me on that one. Go ahead, brother. These writers express negative opinions about Afri Africans and other primitives. Come on. Sit on that. No, it's not. Flip it on the back. There you go. Based on purely subjective impressions or materials gained from secondary sources such as travelers, missionaries, and explorers, these philosophers expressed the common attitude of this period most also had investments in the slave trade or slavery. So they're telling you you're inferior, they're telling you you're less than a person, but they have massive money tied up in slavery. Slave boats, slave ships, and slave products. But they're telling you you're inferior, so they have a financial gain for you to believe that you're inferior, or the world to believe that we're inferior. Of course this is caused by God, I'm just showing you the mechanism behind it. Go ahead, sir. Although many learned men were involved in this enterprise, it was the classifications development by the Swedish botanist Carlo Car Carolinus Lainus. Go ahead. And the, and the German psychologist Johann Friedrich. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. That's the person that actually created, he took Lainus's, uh, he took Lainus's um, classification of races and embellished it. So he's the one who modified the hierarchical structure of humanity with us being on the bottom. Go ahead, sir. That provided the models and terms for modern racial classifications. Scientific classifications of race. All right, we'll stop that. Now, you guys got a clear understanding that race does not exist. Some of y'all do. Now, I'm going to show you out of I'm going to show you Johann Friedrich Blumenbach's own words concerning how he classified us. There you go, sir. A short history of the race concepts. Michael Udell, Ph.D., MPH. At the dawn of the 21st century, the idea of race, the belief that the people of the world can be organized into biologically distinctive groups, each with their own physical, social, and in intellectual characteristics. Do you understand that your skin color is attributed to your social status, your intellectual status, and your economics? I don't think y'all understand that. Something is being applied to you that does not exist, that dictates your entire being. Race does not exist. It's a lie. If anyone tries to bring race into the picture or the comment with you, you check them and tell them that race was created by Europeans. It does not exist. Go ahead, sir. It's understood by most natural and social scientists to be unsound, an unsound concept. Please tell them that again. What is race 
now amongst educational scientists, what do they consider race to be? Go ahead, sir. The way scientists think about race today, after all, is different than it was in the wake of the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement, when some promoted black genetic inf inferior, inf inferiority. inferiority as an argument against e egalitarian social and economic policy, and certainly different than one or two centuries ago as scientific justifications for slavery and later Jim Crow were articulated. Scientific justification for slavery and Jim Crow. Scientific justification for Jim Crow and slavery. I don't think y'all understand it. The psychosis may be deeper than I think. Go ahead, bro. <laughs> In other words, race, it's scientific meaning seemingly drawn from the visual and genetics cues of human diversity is an idea with a measurable past, identifiable, present, and uncertain future. Come on. These changes are influenced by a range of variables, including geography, politics, politics, culture, science, and economics. Next page, sir. Here's a direct quote from the person Carolinus that created the hierarchical structure. This is why he said what he said about all of the races, so-called races. Go ahead, sir. The Swedish botanist, botanist, botanist and naturalist Corliss Linnaeus Come on. Also made lasting contributions to the race concept at this time. Come on. Natural natural symptom symptoms natural system which became the basis for the classifications of all species, divided, divided humanity, humanity into four groups. Four groups. Four groups. This European dude, sitting up in his laboratory, decided to create four groups of people based on the great chain of being. Go ahead, sir. Americans, Aztecs, African, Africanists, and Europeanists. To these groups, he ascribed typology, topology, topology, or I'm physical sorry, topography. I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. Or physical and behavioral characteristics. Americanists were reddish, choleric, and erect hair, black, white nostrils. These are Indians. Go ahead. Aspenite, Mary free, regulate by customs. Asinaticus were melanotically stiff hair, black dark eyes, severe haughty. These are Orientals, by the way. Go ahead. Avercius ruled by opinions. Avarin that was avaricious. Avaricious means greedy. He said the Orientals are greedy and regulated by opinions. Go ahead, sir. Avaricious ruled by opinions. Africanists were black. So these are, this is us. This is Lioness's description of us. Go ahead, sir. Philgamatic, hair black, frizzled, nose flat, lips tumid, women without shame. They lactate profusely. Stop. Women without shame who lactate profusely? What is he talking about? Go ahead, sir. Crafty, indolent. So we're crafty. And indolent. Go ahead, sir. Nigilant. Governed by caprice. Finally, the Europeans were white. Seeing you now, muscular, white, blue, gentile, <laughs> inventive, <laughs> governed by laws. Governed by laws. Now, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Who did he compliment the most out of all of those hierarchical races? And who got the worst description? What you guys don't understand, and what I had to find out was, this is how the construct views us. This is why we are viewed this way. The prevailing thought created this, so the world could think this to justify slavery because they had a financial gain. Y'all understand that concept? Couple of thumbs. Go ahead, bro. 
Towards the end of the 18th century, German scientist Joanne Blumingbeck Come on. constructed a racial classification that built upon Lewinin's work and proposed five racial types. So basically, he took what Carolinas did, tucked it in, throw another race type in there, and phew, ran with it. Go ahead, bro. Caucasians, Mongolian, Ethiopian, American, and Malay. Come on. Blumingbeck's addition posited the Caucasian as the idea or mean race, and on either side of that, mean were racial extremes. So Caucasians, Caucasians are the ideal race. Caucasians, according to this person, is the ideal race. Race doesn't exist, it's made up. He said, Caucasians are the ideal race, and everyone that deviates from the mean is what? Go ahead, sir. Mongolian and Ethiopian on one side, and the American and Malay on the other. Both, both divergencies from the Caucasian idea were considered inferior. So if you're not Caucasian, according to these people that created the concept of race to scientifically justify your inferiority based on philosophy from Aristotle, based on what they're saying, you should just be happy to exist and you are, the, you are inferior, permanently, fixed. You can't get away from it. This is what they tell you. So, when, so understand the implication when someone says race to you. This is what race means when they say it to you. You correct them, you say God deals with heritage groups, not races. Y'all understand me on that? A couple of y'all understand me on that. Praise the Most High. Now, again, we're dealing with the false narrative. We're dealing with the story. This is the story. Now, how do you sell a story? You sell, you sell a story through propaganda, right? Propaganda is how you convince everyone else to believe your story. Thank you. I don't need anything else from that. We're going to go to, no, we're going to go to a movie that was one of the first movies ever shown in America that it actually premiered in the White House, okay? This movie is called, go ahead, bro, Birth of a Nation. This movie is called The Birth of a Nation. Go ahead, sir. The Birth of a Nation. The Birth of a Nation originally called The Klansman. Stop. The movie was originally called The Klansman. What is that about? Y'all tell me what that is about. This is not a rhetorical question. What, if I tell you, hey, let's go see a movie called The Klansman, what are you gonna tell me? <laughs> this is the proverb. This is the proverb. This is the story. They believe that we're inferior because it was made up. Now here's the propaganda to sell this to the world. Go ahead, sir. Is a 1915 American silent epic drama film directed and co-produced by D.W. Griffith and starring Leland Gish. The screenplay is adapted from the novel and play The Klansman, both by Thomas Dixon Jr. As well as Dixon's novel, The Leopard Spot, Griffith co-wrote the screenplay with Frank E. Woods and co-produced the film with Harry Aitiken. Come on. It was released on February 8, 1945. The film is three hours long. 1915 or 1945? 1915. Thank you. The film is three hours long and was originally presented in two parts, separated by an intermission. It was the first 12, 12 reel film in the United States. We got a, the first 12 reel film in the United States is called The Klansman and it's three hours long and it's about us. Go ahead, sir. The film chronicles the relationship of two families in the American Civil War and Reconstruction era over the course of several years. Come on. The pro-Union, Northern Stoneman, and the pro-Confederacy, Southern Camerason, Camerons. The, assass the assassinations of Abraham Lincoln by John Wilkes Booth is dramatized. The film was a commercial success, though it was highly controversial for its portrayal of black men, many played by white actors in black faces. Stop. The movie that was one of the first films in the United States shown in the White House depicted black men, and they weren't black men, they were white men in black face. 
portraying us. This is propaganda. This is to substantiate this narrative. I don't think y'all understand. So when you look at TV nowadays and you see this image of us, understand where it came from. We're perpetuating something that they gave to us. Go ahead, sir. As unintelligent and sexually aggressive. Start at the top about black men again. Come on. The film was a commercial success. Though it was highly controversial for its portrayal of black men, many played by white actors in black faces. Come on. As unintelligent and sexually aggressive towards white women. Unintelligent and sexually aggressive towards white women. Look how you sell the narrative. Look how you sell it. You use fear to sell the narrative, to, 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 to show the whole world those scientists that said those you know what's are this way is true. Look at what they're doing on the screen. Go ahead, sir. And the betrayal of the Ku Klux Klan. The who? Ku Klux Klan. Come on. As a heroic, for heroic force. So you got black people, I'm sorry, white men in black face abusing, running, running wild and rampaging, and you have the Klan as the heroic force that stops these black people, played by white people. I mean, does, does this sit well with everyone in this crowd right now? Go ahead, bro. There were widespread black, black protests against the birth of a nation, such as in Boston, while thousands of white bo Let me bo see Bostonians. Tell them right there. Now that's for here. You're you're missing. Hold on. Oh no, you're not. It's a reconstruction. Reconstruction. Stone Man and his protege, Silas Lynch, a mulatto exhi exhibiting psychopathic tendencies, head to south. So you got a half black man in this movie that is a psychopath. One of the main protagonists in this movie is a half black person who is a psychopath. I don't think y'all understand. Go ahead, bro. Head to South Carolina to observe the implementation of reconstruction policies firsthand. Come on. During the election in which Lynch is elected, Lieutenant Governor, blacks are observed stuffing the ballot boxes while many whites are denied the vote. That's a lie. All races at that point, when the, uh, the, the voting act was passed, blacks and whites had the vote. They're portraying it, they're portraying that only black people had the vote in this movie. And again, the black people in this movie, the black men are played by white men in blackface. Just so we're clear, this is propaganda to sell you the inferiority and the insanity. This is the proverb right here. This is the proverb. Go ahead, sir. The newly elected mostly black members of South Carolina legislator are shown at their desk displaying inappropriate behavior, such as one member taking off his shoes and putting his feet up on the guests and others drinking liquor and feasting on stereotypical African-American fairs such as fried chicken. Stop. Mm -hmm. So we got, we have our elected officials that are black in this movie sitting up with their shoes off, drinking liquor, and eating chicken. And this is a white man depiction of this. This is something that they projected upon us to substantiate the proverb that we're inferior. Go ahead, sir. Meanwhile, inspired by observing white children pretending to be ghosts to scare black children. Come on. Ben fights back by forming the Ku Klux Klan. By forming what? The Ku Klux Klan. Come on. As a result, Elsie, out of loyal, loyalty to her father, breaks off her relationship with Ben. This is a white woman, by the way. Go ahead. Later, Flora Cameron goes off alone into the woods to fetch water and is followed by Gus. A free, a free man. This is a white man in black face going after this white woman, by the way, in this movie. Go ahead, sir. A free man and soldier who is now a captain. Come on. He confronts Flora and tells her that he desires to get married. Frightened, she flees into the forest, pursued by Gus. Trapped on a precipice, a pre precipice Flora warns Gus. She would jump if he comes any closer. So she's like, I don't want you. She's over a cliff. The black man is lurching towards her. And what happens? Go ahead, sir. When he does, she leaps to her death. She leaps to her death. 
Go ahead, sir. Having run through the forest looking for her, Ben has seen her jump. He holds her as she dies, then carries her body back to the Cameron home. Go to number three, please. You guys understand in the propaganda of the proverb, they're selling this to the world right now. And this is the prevailing thought in the construct concerning us, that we are inferior scientifically, and that black men are aggressive, and that black, that black women are, what do they say, without shame. This is, what they're this is what they have sold, and this is what perpetuates and permeates this culture. This is why we have a psychosis. Go ahead, sir. Both Griffith and Dixon, in letters to the press, dismissed African-American protests against the birth of a nation. So black people that saw the movie was like, this is garbage, this is not how we are. And they told him, they, they sent letters to stop him. This is what he thought. He was very dismissive. Go ahead, sir. Saying that the reason black men disliked the film was because they wanted to have sex with white women. No, it's not the Ku Klux Klan. It's not the fact that there's white men in black face chasing us down. It's not the fact that they portray white men in black face drinking liquor and eating chicken. It's just because black men want to have sex with white women. Go ahead, man. <laughs> and, and the film depicted misincentization as an evil. In a letter to the New York Globe, Griffith wrote that the film was an influence against the intermarriages of blacks and whites. This is the agenda. This is the proverb. Go ahead. Dixon likewise called the NAACP the Negro Intermarried Society. So you see how, now here, I'm going to liken this to something that's going on right now with the brothers taking a knee. Brothers taking a knee is about police brutality, not disrespecting the flag and all that other stuff. But notice it's been spun around to something that's different than the auspice of it, or shall I say the, progener the, the reason for it. This is what's going on here. It's not because, oh, we're not inferior and this is offensive. It's because black men want to have sex with white women. That's why I don't, don't worry about nothing they're talking about. Matter of fact, the NAACP is the National Intermarriage Group. You see the story, the proverb. Go ahead, sir. And said it was against the birth of a nation for one reason only, because it opposed to the marriage of blacks to whites. Come on. Griffith, ignorant at the film, at the film's negative critical receptions, wrote letters to newspapers and published a pamphlet in which he accused his critics of censoring unpopular opinions. Griffith's 1916 pamphlet, The Rise and Fall of a Free Speech in America, used racialized language. Used what kind of language? Racialized. Come on. Language and images, such as cartoons that depict censorship as a monstrous black man. Wait, censorship was depicted as what? Monstrous black man. Come on. With a lasciviousness, expressions on his face, eyeing free speech, who appeared as a white woman distressed in white dress. So again, we got the black man as a villain, we got the white woman involved to sell the fear, and this is what he's using to sell this proverb. Again, this is a long line of proverbs or stories that's told about us, but not by us. Go ahead, sir. Free speech points at censorship, saying, all history, all reasons condemns you. Go. In his pamphlet, Griffith called censorship this malignant who had mutated into a fully grown Caliban, a character from William Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, who is often depicted as a black man. Now, enough with that. Proverb, that was 1950, I'm sorry, 15. That is the early 20th century. Now let me show you what's going on now. Let's see if it's changed. Give me uh, the Penn State bias. Nope, 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 nope. We don't have the Penn State. All right, we don't have a Penn State. A study done in Penn State actually showed that there's a Negro, there's a black person with an ape, a black ape bias. That is, oh, you have it, huh? No? I thought you had it. I put it away because I thought you had it. All right, let's get to Google.
Give me Google. Google now. So we got a black man rampaging, acting crazy in 1915. We got the story that black people are genetically inferior, and that's coming from science. We have uh, the black ape bias, right? Association with black people being apes. Now let me tell you about what Google is talking about with their software. Their software has a bias also. Go ahead, sir. Yep. So this is Google executive warns of face ID bias. A face ID bias. The computers, the algorithm has a bias against us. I don't think y'all understand what we're dealing with right now. The proverb has even gone down to an electronic form to where the computers, the algorithms have a bias against us. Go ahead, sir. Dave Lee, North American technology reporter. Come on. 27th of July, 2018. Facial recognition, facial recognition technology does not yet have the diversity it needs. And as inherited bias, a top Google executive has warned. Facial recognition has an inherited, an inherent bias. The soft, the computer has a bias against us. I don't think y'all understand what we're talking about right now. The computer has a bias. The software has a bias against us. Go ahead, sir. The remark from the FIMS director of cloud computing, Diane Green, came after rival Amazon software wrongly identified 28 members of Congress. This appropriately people of color as police Dis suspects. Disproportionately. So in other words, when they put the faces in the computer, it picked black faces as criminals more than it did other nations. Go ahead, sir. Google, which has not opened its facial recognition technology to public use, was working on gathering vast sums of data to improve reliability, Ms. Green said. However, she refused to discuss the company's controversial work with the military. Bad things happen when I talk about Maven. I didn't bring in, I didn't even bring in Project Maven. That would have scared everybody. Go ahead, sir. Ms. Green said, referring to a soon to be abandoned project with the US military to develop artificial intelligence technology for drones. After considerable employees pressured, including resignation, Google said it would not renew its contract with the Pentagon after it lapsed sometime in 2019. The that's film? it? Yeah, that's it. All right. Oh, now, here's an addition. We know the software has a bias. I didn't have the Penn State study for some reason. I guess it's over there. The Penn State study that I was talking about, there's a, there's a, uh, a, black, a black person in ape bias. Google actually had a situation happen. Where's that other one at, behind there? Yeah, this one right here. Read this just, one. One of Google's softwares that has algorithms that they said has a bias said a black couple, it categorized a black couple as apes. I guess y'all don't, y'all like, whatever, huh? <laughs> it's whatever, huh? <laughs> Please read that to them. Let them know what, what the algorithm for the artificial intelligence classifies us as. The computers have a bias against us. Y'all don't understand. This is, why, this is why this lesson was done, so you guys can understand exactly what we're up against. So we're not just out here popping our fingers and lollygagging. The game is tilted against us. Of course, it's for what we did, but I'm showing you all the intensity of this. This is not a game, folks. Go ahead, bro. Google says it is appalled, appalled that its new photos at mistakenly labeled a black couple as being gorillas. Please read that again, sir. They ain't hearing you. Google says it is appalled that its new photo app mistakenly labeled a black couple as being gorillas. Go ahead. Its product automatically tags uploaded pictures using its own artificial intelligence software. Artificial intelligence software that has biases. Go ahead, sir. The error was brought to its attention by a New York-based software developer who was who was one of the people pictured in the photos involved. So a software developer sees his picture with him and his woman classified as gorillas on this Google site, and he flipped his wig. Go ahead, sir. Google was later criticized on social media because of the label's racist connotations. Come on. 
This is 100% not okay. Acknowledged Google, Google executive Yon, Yonatan Zunger after being contacted by Zaki Alson via Twitter. Come on. It was high on my list of bugs you never want to see happen. Duh. Mr. Mr. Zunger said Google had already taken steps to avoid others experiencing a similar mistake. That's it. So you have the hierarchical structure of races designed by Europeans, right? Refined to make sure that we are inferior. You have propaganda selling that we're inferior. Not only that, we're rapists, we're insane, we're monsters. And then you have computer algorithms that have biases against us. Do you understand what we're up against? Do you understand how prolific this proverb, this story that is told about us is? Now, I'm going to get to the byword. It said, the book said we're going to be proverbs. I think I've demonstrated that outside the book in reality. So if someone wants to ask you about why we're dealing with what we're dealing with as a black person, tell them about all this, birth of a nation, blackface, everything else, rapists, women without shame. You tell them about that. You tell them about a software bias that identified a black couple as, a goril as gorillas, and then you tell them about, and I'm only going to use this word once because it's the worst word mm -hmm. to ever use, the nigger mm -hmm. mythos. E-R. Martin Luther King said, the thingification of black people leaves us with a sense of nobodiness. Now, I'm, this is what I'm telling you guys. In reality, what is that word? What is that? We didn't invent that. The meaning behind that was invented by someone else and applied to us. I don't think y'all understand what I'm telling y'all. When other nations say that word, there's about 20 to 50 negative connotations that are invoked by that word. When you add that with the birth of a nation and a black man jumping out of a bush trying to grab you, you have the, the 20 negative connotations and you have a mythos associated with it, I'm here to tell y'all, that is why the fear is so high when it comes to them looking at us and dealing with us, all right? Not only is it 20 negative connotations, it's expressed with the lowest disdain. When I say it, if I'm hanging out and I say it with my partners, I'm not trying to hurt my partner. I'm not saying it to, to hurt him. When another nation says that to me, they're trying to cut me to my being by saying that. They're implying I'm lazy, I'm crazy, I'm this, I'm that. It's not true. Don't help them with that. If you're in public and you see a gang of them around you, do not use that word. Do not help them punch you in the face. Y'all with me on that? Now. I'm going to show you how the byword follows you wherever you are. Let's go to Nazi Germany and see what word they applied to black people. Give me the German, give me the German uh, proverb right there. I mean, the German byword, brother. Black Germans and the Holocaust. Come on. Lecture delivered at the International Slavery Museum, Liverpool, on January, on 27 January 2015. Come on, brother. Let me start at the end of the story with the post-war testimony of a woman called Soya K. She was the daughter of a C Cameronian man and his German wife. Raised by her mother after her parents divorced, she was 15 when Hitler came to power in 1933. Come on. In April 1951, she applied to the Bearland Compensation Office for a substantial compensation in view of what she had suffered between the Nazi takeover in 1933 and the end of the war. This was the story she told. In the summer of 1933, Nazis took over the suburban villa. Nazis. Nazis took over the suburban villa where she and her mother lived, declaring that a cellar was good enough for people who were racially inferior in 1936. She was expelled from her secondary school along with a half-Jewish schoolmate. In the summer of 1936, she was declared stateless. Having hoped to study medicine, she was unable to get work because of her skin color. Because of what? Her skin color. Her intelligence. Skin color. Her behavior. Skin color. Come on. So she trained as a dancer and traveled to, the, to France with a theatrical revive. Go to the next page. I don't think y'all understand. The, the byword follows you wherever you are. 
wherever you are. The Lord said you will be a proverb, which is a story and a byword, and it would follow you wherever you are and be a sign of who you are. I think we've proved that, even to the point where the computers have a bias against you. Inanimate objects that don't think have a bias against us. Y'all ain't hearing me. Go ahead, bro. Police Bureau on all nigger and... I think we ne skipped something. Where's two? Back. Give me two and three. Let me step back now and outline the pattern and, and trajectory of official policy towards blacks in Nazi Germany. There is no question that fear and hatred of Jews stood at the century, at the century of Nazi thinking about what the Nazis called race. So and we know how they felt about Jews, right? We're clear. So-called Jews, Nazis didn't like them, right? But guess who else they didn't like? Go ahead, sir. Called race and motivated the key measures that the regime in introduced. At the same time, it's clear that blacks were marked out from a very early stage as a group that would need to be dealt with. That would need to be what? Dealt with. We were marked out as a group that needed to be dealt with. What does dealt with sound like to y'all? If somebody says, I'm going to go deal with that dude, what are they talking about? They're going to bang him out, right? Go ahead, bro. In the general reordering of society and the purity of German blood. The purity of what? German blood. Come on. Was to be ensured for the future. Come on. Nevertheless, the American idea of race. Stop. Germany got its idea of race from America. Germany got its idea of how to deal with us from America. Go ahead, sir. Nevertheless, the American idea of race as a matter of skin color. As a matter of what? Skin color. Come on. Was a powerful element in the discussion among Nazi policymakers that led up to the Nuremberg laws. The justice minister thought it would be easy to get ordinary Germans to accept and adhere to new race laws as long as they could see who the racial aliens were. Now, skip over and give me five. Tell me what they called black people in Germany. It was a crime to be black in Germany. You know how we have all this ish these issues now where, you know, selling water while being black, et cetera, et cetera? Let's see something. Go ahead, give me five and six, bro. It isn't entirely clear what lay behind the 1942 order, but it looks like part of a general radicalization in policy towards the whole range of racial aliens that took place in wartime. Racial aliens. In other words, you're not part of the human race. You're something completely different. You're a racial alien. We're racial aliens. Go ahead, sir. Himmler's order for the registration of blacks was issued at the same time as he was giving close attention to the questions of how Germany's gypsy population might be managed and the result of his deliberations in that case was that the overwhelming majority of, majority of German gypsies were adopted to ask with. Come on. Now anyone entered in in concentrated camps had their racial status recorded. But in the second half of the war, we find some evidence that, that people were being arrested simply for being black. Stop. Now we're here. In Nazi Germany, if you were black, you got arrested on GP, off top. Does that sound similar to what's going on right now? Does it sound like a story that is following us about us that we didn't create is causing these things? Our transgression against God caused the God, the God of Israel to say these things are going to happen. I'm just showing y'all it happening, not only in the pages and confines of the Bible, but outside in history. When someone wants to ask you about the condition, you are now going to be able to have an intelligent conversation with them, an unemotional intelligent conversation. Go ahead, sir. Like 14-year-old son and an African-American man, Gerd Sturman, arrested in 1944, his prisoner card at Buschenwald concentration camp gave Nager Nager Misling. Say that again. 
What, what, what did his card say? Bush went, Bush, Bush and Wald concentration camp gave Nigger Mischling. Nigger Mischling. Nigger Mischling. That's German for you and me. That is the, it's, that is the byword. Follows you all over this planet. You look at Afro-Colombians right now, they caught up in the middle of a drug war between the paramilitary group and the Colombian government, and it's in their community. I don't think y'all hearing me. Nigger Minchling. That's the byword that follows you everywhere you go. Let's go back to the book now. So we dealt with the story. We dealt with the proverb and the byword, right? Thoroughly, we dealt with that, I think. Now, let's go back to the book. Deuteronomy 28, 41. Don't let nobody tell you about race at all. And you inform them exactly what's going on. Loose statements made about us by people that don't care about us will not be tolerated by me personally. I'm going to put this on the table unemotionally. Let them be the judge. Deuteronomy 28, 41. Go ahead, brother. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. All thy they, all they trees and thy fruit of thy land shall the locusts consume. Come on. The stranger that is within thee shall get up, up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. Come on. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Please read 44 again. Go he ahead, He shall bro. lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Now, normally at this part in the lesson, some of my teachers would point out that in our neighborhoods, X, Y, and Z, we don't have any businesses. I'm going to go way here with it. Give me the wealth gap. This is how far behind we are to other nations, just so we have a clear understanding of what we're dealing with. This comes from CNN Money. Go ahead, sir. CNN Money. 656... Wait, flip it over and just read. I'm sorry. No, no. There you go. There you go. Sorry about that. The wealth gap between blacks and whites in America will take hundreds of years to close, if ever. Stop. Let that soak in. The wealth gap between us and everyone else, including Gentiles, will take hundreds of years to close, if ever. Go ahead, sir. If current trends persist, it will take 228 years for black families to accumulate the same amount of wealth as whites, according to a report released this week from the Corporation for Economic Development. Stop. Do y'all understand what he's reading right now? 220, how many years? 228 years for us to accumulate the same amount of wealth as Gentiles. Y'all ain't hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. When they tell you to pick yourself up by your bootstraps, you tell them that's easy to say, but it would take 228 years for us as a nation to catch up to you guys. Unemotionally, you say that. Go ahead, sir, we ain't done. We're giving, we're giving in the business today, man. Come on. And the, institute, and the Institute for Policy Studies for Latino families, it would take 84 years. How many years? 84. Yeah, go ahead, bro. Over the past 30 years, the average household wealth of white families has grown 85% to 656,000. Stop. How much? 656,000. 656,000 is the average. Yeah, I like these faces. These are the faces I had when I read this. This is stark. This is not a game, y'all. Y'all got to understand, this is not a game. Go ahead, sir. Well, that of blacks has climbed just 27% to $85,000. Go ahead, brother. And Latinos, 69% to $98,000. Come on. We're seeing wealth concentrating in fewer and fewer hands, and those hands are overwhelmingly white. Come on. Said Josh Hoxie, who leads the Project on Opportunity and Taxation at the Institute for Policy Studies. Now, we're done with that. Thank you, sir. Now, this is what I did. I got the numbers, because you know I'm a numbers dude, right? 
So I found that the, the total aggregate wealth of the United States is at $94 trillion. $94 trillion, okay? This is according to June, a June 20, 2017 article from Forbes. Gentiles collectively control 90% or $87 trillion of that wealth. And Israel, so-called black people, we control 3% at $3 trillion. A trillion is a million millions, or 10 raised to the power of 12. Now, 228 years to pick ourselves up, right? To catch up, not pick ourselves up. Now, here's the narrative in the echo chamber right now. Slavery is over, it's done. Pick yourself up, you should do better. Okay, I will take that. And my retort to that is slavery in America went on for 245 years. Did you guys know that slavery went on for 245 years? I'm taking it that some of y'all didn't. I didn't until I looked into it. From 1624 to 1863, after the 13th Amendment was, was uh, enacted, we were free without any transfer of property, goods, clothing, housing, wealth with which to build, okay? Now watch this. This is going to really make y'all mad. Don't get mad. Just keep it as facts. While that was happening, they had this thing called the Homestead Act of 1862, which granted anyone who knew about the Homestead Act could apply for, after paying a small registration fee, could receive 160 acres of public land public land with the condition of building at least a, a, a dwelling of 12 by 14 feet. They had to occupy the land, build the dwelling for, for five years and grow crops on part of it, okay? This went on, this right here, the Homestead Act, went on until 1976. This was going on for 95 years. Any one of us, any one of our parents, our families could have scooped up 160 acres. Y'all hearing me on this? Y'all with me on this? And while this was going on, they had this thing called the Morrill Act of 1865. And it was reviewed in 1890, which allowed states to sell some of this public land to build land-grant colleges. Now, the land-grant colleges were, were supposed to teach engineering, farming, and military tactics to supplement the Homestead Act of 1862. Now, who took advantage of all this? Did we take advantage of it? Did we even know about it? Could we even read to register to have our 160 acres? By 1900, 80 million acres, 80 million acres, had been granted to US citizens, and a majority of free slaves were sharecropping. We weren't given 40 acres in a mule. How are we gonna, how are we gonna pick ourselves up with nothing? Half of us didn't even know we were freed. Picking whatever agricultural product in adverse conditions for 10 to 14 hours a day without proper food and medical attention, but you're telling me to pick myself up when your ancestors had access to 160 acres of public land and schooling and low-cost loans. Martin Luther King turned me on to that. That's the rebuttal to the pick yourself up argument. Pick myself up, it would take 228 years for me to pick myself up. Now, I'm not telling you guys to just fall down and don't fight. I'm just giving you guys the knowledge of what, you're up, what we're up against. We control 3T, 3 trillion. That's a start. Back to the Bible. Y'all with me on this so far? Deuteronomy 28, 45. Do you understand why we have a psychosis right now, family? You understand why we deal with what we deal with and nobody cares. We ain't even have time to heal. No emotions. I'm getting excited. Let me calm down. Unemotional when you bring this information to them. No loose commentary by anyone on my people. We can comment on us. Do you care about me to comment on me while you're imputing and accusing me? Do you really want to know why? Do you really want to help fix the situation? Or are you just trying to just splatter some of your prejudices at me. Well, if you want to, I got some facts for you. Back to the book. Deuteronomy 28, 4 5th. Drop 4, 4 5 on them, man. Come on. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee, and overtake thee, till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. Come on. And they shall be upon thee for a sign, and for a wonder, and upon thy seed forever. A sign and a wonder. 
all this aforementioned research, does this dictate, is this specific to anyone else but us? This literally proves what we're reading out of the Bible that was written 3,425 years ago. Go ahead, my brother. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Some things. All things. Come on. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in one of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. Stop. When my mother went out to uh, DC, she went to a slave museum and she saw that they had child-sized chains. Child-sized chains of various ages. A yoke of iron on your children, on our children. This causes a psychosis. This is continual abuse. Go ahead, sir. The Lord, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle, as the eagle flieth. A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. A nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. Now, this, this, this nation isn't just Gentiles. I'm not trying to be on some rail on a Gentiles moment. I am just equipping you to have an intelligent conversation, an intelligent, unemotional conversation with Gentiles concerning us when they want to, when they want to speak on us. I'm going to show you the nations involved in this. Let's go to Psalms 83. I'm going to show you that this is worldwide. This just ain't America. America is too small scale. We're talking worldwide to where you won't escape. You go to Colombia, guess what? You got Afro-Colombians living without, without running water. And they got problems. Psalms 83. I'm going to show you these nations, and I'm going to show you what these nations said. And I'm going to show you how these nations feel about us. It's not just Gentiles. And bear in mind, a lot of these are Hamitic people. These are Hamitic people. So before we start trying to throw eggs at Gentiles and everybody, these are Hamitic people, some of them. Go ahead, brother. Verse 2. For lo, thine enemies make atonement, a, to a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. The people that hate us lift up their heads. Go ahead, sir. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. We're going to deal with hidden ones later on. Hidden ones. People that are hidden that no one knows about. Go ahead, sir. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Read that again, sir. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Come on. For they have consulted together with one, con with one consent. Consent. They have con confederate against us. The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarines. Hagarines. These are Hamitic people. These are Hamites. These are people that look like us. Go ahead, sir. Gebal and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitations of Tyre. Tyre. Come on. Ashur also is joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Skip down to verse 12. Go ahead, brother. Who said, let us take to ourselves the house of God in possession. So they said as they gleefully conspired against us to sell us into the hands of all these other nations. Because see, here's the argument. Well, black people sold other black people. Well, all black people are not black people. All black people are not the same. French people are different from Swedish people, different, different people. All right, y'all with me on that concept. Now let's go to Deuteronomy 28, back to Deuteronomy 28. How can we not have a psychosis with what we're dealing with in our environment, these stressors that we've dealt with for 245 years, and slavery has only been over for 155 years? In other words, slavery went on longer than, it, than it's been over. We haven't had time to heal. Deuteronomy 28. These are just facts, immutable empirical evidence to substantiate the Bible. This is the conversation I have with Israel. 
With a Gentile, I had a conversation with the facts. I don't want them to dismiss me. I want them to pay attention. Deuteronomy 28, we're going 63 through uh, 68. Go ahead, my brother. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. And ye shall be plucked from off the land, whither thou goest to possess it. Plucked means taken away. Go ahead, sir. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there, and there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither, there, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Come on. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy feet Thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. Does this sound like a psychosis? Does this sound like a mental, this, does this sound like some, a condition you want your mind to be in on a constant basis? Go ahead, sir. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have known assurance of thy life. Come on. In the morning thou shalt say, would God, if, would God, if were even, and at even thou shalt say, would God, it were morning. In other words, no matter what time of day, you're going to be like, I wish it was the other time of day. <laughs> Go ahead, brother. For the fear of thine heart, wherewith while thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. Common theme is what we're going to see is going to make us crazy. Go ahead, sir. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. Now what does Egypt represent? Because if we figure out what Egypt represents, then these ships and this correlation will kind of make a little bit more sense. Let's see what Egypt represents. Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. One verse, very tactical. What is Egypt? How do you get, he said, I'm going to bring you into Egypt. Okay, what is that? Deuteronomy 6, one verse, verse 21. Let's figure out what Egypt is, brother. Go ahead. Then thou shalt say unto thy son, we, we were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. What is a bondman? Egypt represents slavery because that was our first slavery. There have been so far, I think, about four iterations if you count Egypt of slavery. Egypt represents slavery. This is a predictor of chattel slavery. Chattel slavery. I need the chattel slavery handout, sir. Before that, that reminds me. Let me explain the difference between prejudices and racism. Everybody has prejudices. Everybody. All nationalities have prejudices, right? Somebody might not like Chinese women drivers or whatnot, right? Not to say that, but I'm just keeping it 1,000, all right? But the difference between prejudice and racism is I can change my mind from my prejudices. It just requires me to change my mind. Racism is different. Racism has laws associated with it and other legal mechanisms designed to provide cultural advantages to one heritage group while relegating the other heritage group to disadvantages permanently. Prejudice, I'm sorry, racism requires laws to change that, not a mindset change. I'm going to show you the laws that were set against us that was designed specifically for us. Chattel slavery, brother. Let them know what chattel slavery is. The, ide the ideology origins of chattel slavery in the British world. Come on. Transcri transcript of the, of the Slavery Remembrance Day Memorial Lecture at Liverpool Town Hall, August 21st, 2007. Come on, brother. The lecture was given by Dr. Molifi Katit at Assistain, and distingu and a distinguished author most recently of the history history of African and professor in the Department of African American Studies at Temple University, USA. Come on. The thread that held these 
contradictions together was the acceptance of the idea that Africans... Wait, flip it over. I think you missed something. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. No, you didn't. Go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. Go the ahead. thread that held these contradictions together was the acceptance of the idea that Africans were to tell property. Were what? To tell property. Property. But we were property. Matter of fact, we was property for 245 years. That's the mindset. So we're not human and we're property. This is the struggle that we have, being considered not human and being considered property in the minds of the world. That will cause the treatment that we have experienced. Go ahead, sir. By the time of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, the English colonies of North America had experienced more than 100 years of steady introduction in the legal idea that Africans were, ch were chattel and, and on the moral idea that Africans had no rights to life. This is racism. This is the difference of racism and prejudice. Racism says there are laws that reinforce a prejudice. There was laws on the books that said we were property, that we were less than human, that is the story, and there were laws to reinforce that by saying we were property. And I dare say there's a lot of people that still feel that way to this day. Go ahead, sir. Liberty or the pursuit of happiness that whites had to respect. Come on. Dehumanization of Africans. Come on. Thus, the, or the origin of race and racism in the 17th century became a, a basis for the categories of subordination and hedge, hegemony, although today we are aware that the race myth is problematic. The European colonists and slave traders of the 17th and 18th centuries were sure that there were genetic and biological differences that constituted whites as superior. So because of, because of Carolina Linus and Johann Blumenbach, that made them put together laws that said we're not human beings. The, the prevailing thought of us being less than human allowed people to go in to make legislation that made us property. Per what the Lord said, he will bring us into chattel slavery. Chattel slavery. Go ahead, sir. Whites as superiors beings to blacks. Thus what whites were constructing was something more sinister, that ritualistic, racial, bigotry. They created an oppressive, systematic form of dehumanization of Africans. Stop. A suppressive, systemic, or systematic form. A person will toot their lips to tell you that there is no systemic racism nowadays. They will tell you that. Ben Shapiro will tell you that there is no racism. OK? There's, an, there's a, uh, a Yale-educated white supremacist that actually put together some so-called study that talks, it's called the color of law, reinforcing these beliefs. Here's my point. If someone ever tells you there's no such thing as systemic racism, you ask them, how do you explain chattel slavery then? Because that is a law. That is a legal mechanism designed to make you not be property. Y'all ain't hearing me. Go ahead, my brother. One might claim that the leading, uh, the leading opinion makers, philosophers, and theologians of the European enslavers organized the categories of blackness as property value. We Africans were, in, in fact, without soul, spirit, emotions, desires, and rights. Please read that again. They ain't hearing any, man. Read that again, brother. European enslavers organized the category of blackness as property value. Property value, what else? We Africans were, in fact, in an, we Africans were in effect without souls. Stop. We had no souls. Go ahead, sir. Spirit. No spirit, go ahead. Emotions. Come on. Desires and rights. Chattel could have neither mind nor spirit. That's it. Chattel slavery, property could have neither no mind or spirit. They're not concerned with your feelings. The, your, the hierarchical structure dictates that you are inferior. This is the story, this is the mindset, and this is still prevalent. The computer has a bias against us. When people tell you there's no systemic racism, ask them about chattel slavery. And if they want to go further, you take them to the Bible. Now, let's go back to the book. Y'all hearing me on this? Y'all with me on this? Is it hurtful? 
Would this cause a psychosis in anyone? Let's go to Jeremiah 2. Jeremiah 2. Now watch what the Lord says about us. When I first saw this, this blew my mind. But now you're going to really understand the effects. I don't know if you guys knew this, but Chattel slavery, your children, the children that we had were automatically placed in Chattel slavery. Children had no freedom. If your parents were slaves, you were a slave by natural extension in perpetuity. In other words, this right here, Jeremiah 2, let's go 11 through 14. Jeremiah 2, 11 through 14. This is why we're chattel slavery, or should I say was considered chattel slavery, because of what we did. Go ahead, sir. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? Come on, man. But my people have changed their glory for that which doeth not profit. That's why we're chattel, considered chattel slavery without soul. Go ahead, sir. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this end, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. Come on. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the foundation of living waters, and hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. In other words, we traded our God for gods. And as a result of that, should tell slavery. Go ahead, sir. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? Please read that again. I ain't hearing you. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? Chattel slavery made us home-born slaves. Our children's children's children were perpetual slaves. The Lord said, are you a home-born slave? And of course, the answer is yes, according to these laws, according to racism, which has laws. We were home-born slaves. Go ahead, sir. Skip down to verse 17. Has thou not, has thou not procured this unto thyself? Come on. And that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God when he led thee by the way. Skip down to verse 19. Go ahead. Thine own wickedness shall, cor shall correct thee, and by backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter, that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that, thy, and, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord gods of hosts. He said, the Lord said you're a home-born slave, and it's an evil and bitter thing. We're called by God's name. No one will want to do that to their children, but if your children are not going to listen to you, they have to bear the brunt of a punishment. Now, I'm going to show you another sign of Israel. Let's go to Isaiah 42. This is why we have a psychosis as a people. Because of the curses, it causes perpetual abuse, continual, over and over again. We have no time to heal from it, no escape from it. It's pervasive. It's ubiquitous. We're drowning in it. That's why we feel the way we feel. Someone trying to give you loose commentary about it. Don't tolerate it, please. You bring the facts to their attention. Here's another sign of Israel. Isaiah 42, we're going 18 through 25. Go ahead, my brother. Hear ye deaf, and look ye blind, that ye may see. Who is blind but my servant? Or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect? and blind as the Lord's servant, seeing many things, but thou observest not, opening thine ears, but he heareth not. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will, he will magnify the law and make it honorable. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all, they are all of them snared in holes. These are the hidden ones. They consulted against the hidden ones. Go ahead, sir. And they are hid in prison, prison, hid in how, prison houses. Come on. They are for a prey, and none delivereth for a spoil, and none saith restore. Now, I'm going to prove to you that we are hidden in prison houses. Give me the new Jim Crow book, sir. Prison industrial complex is the new Jim Crow. There you go. They pass racist laws. 
indicative or pointing directly to you and me, put us in jail and profit off of us. It is the new slavery. It is the new chattel slavery. Show them about us being put in prison houses, my brother. Most people assume the war on drugs was launched in response to the crisis caused by crack cocaine in the inner city neighborhoods. Come on. This view holds that the racial disparities in drug convictions and sentences, as well as the rapid explosion of the prison population, reflect nothing more than the government's zeal, zealous but benign efforts to address rampant drug crimes in, in poor minority neighborhoods. Come on. This view, while understandable, given the sensational media coverage of crack in the 1980s and 1990s. We're talking about the crack era, y'all. We're talking about the crack era, the drug era, right? After the Frank, Lewis, Frank Lucas heroin era, we're talking about the crack cocaine era and what it did to us. Go ahead, sir. It's simply wrong. It's what? Wrong. That is a farce. The war on drugs was an absolute farce. The person that wrote this book, she's a lawyer, uh, Alexander, Michelle Alexander, OK? She actually wrote this book. She initially did the research to prove that there's no such thing as systemic racism. When she researched it, she found this. Let's deal with the hidden prison houses, though. So we got the, the war on drugs is a lie. Go ahead, sir. While it is true that the publicity surrounding crack cocaine led to the dramatic increase in funding for the drug war, as well as the sentencing policies that greatly accelerated racial disparities in, 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 car, in incarceration rates. There is no truth to the notion that the war on drugs was launched in response to crack cocaine. Come on. President Ronald Reagan officially announced the current drug war in 1982, before crack became an issue in the media or a crisis in poor black neighborhoods. A few years after the drug war was declared, Crack became to spread rapidly in the poor black neighborhoods. In what neighborhoods? The poor black neighborhoods. No, 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 rich white neighborhoods. Poor black neighborhoods. Come on. Of Los Angeles, and later emerged in cities across the country. The Reagan administration hired staff to, to publicize the emergencies of crack cocaine in 1985. So we got, again, we got the birth of a nation. We got the black boogeyman. We got crack cocaine hitting all the black neighborhoods and publicity talking about the crack era in our neighborhoods, right? Go ahead, bro. As a part of strategic effort to, to build public and legislative supports for the war. Stop. Public and legislative support for the war on crack. But it's a war against us. But it's all the prevailing same thought. We're, we're, we're less than human. We're not human. We're chattel property. It's the same story against the same boogeyman. Go ahead, sir. The media campaign was an extraordinary success. Almost overnight, the media was saturated with images of black crack whores, crack dealers, and crack babies. Images that seemed to confirm the worst negative racial stereotype about impoverished inner city residents. Please read that again. Again, D.W. Griffin, propaganda. This is a technique. This is how it's used. Go ahead, sir. Read that again about the crack whores and the crack kids. Come um, on. Almost overnight, the media was saturated with images of black crack whores, crack dealers, and crack babies, and crack baby images that seemed to confirm the worst negative racial stereotype about impoverishment inner, about impoverished inner city residents. Come on. The media bon bonanza surrounding. Bonanza surrounding the new demon drug helped to catapult the war on drugs from an ambitious federal policy to an actual war. Come on. The timing of the crack crisis helped, fuel, helped to fuel conspiracy theories and general speculations. In Pay attention to this part, please. Go ahead. In poor black communities, that the war on drugs was part of a genealogical plan. Genocide a genocide plan. The crack, this, this was genocide, point blank period, which is an extension of eugenics, which is an extension of black people are subservient, they're not, we're not human, and, we and we're property. This was genocide. 
Read what the, read it, brother. Go ahead. A genocide plan by the government to destroy black people in the United States. A genocidal plan by the government to destroy black people. Well, that's a conspiracy. That's a lie. How do we prove that? Please read. For the outset stories circulated on the streets that crack and other drugs were being brought into black neighborhoods by the CIA. Stop. Crack cocaine being brought into the neighborhoods by CIA agents. Now, back in the 80s, I'm sorry, the 90s, if you had told somebody this, they would have told you you was crazy. But now in 2018, it's common knowledge. Everyone knows this. I'm fairly certain someone that's trying to give me a commentary about my people and drug sales and everything, they don't necessarily know that. School them. This was a genocidal plan to bring drugs into our community. Go ahead, sir. Eventually, even the Urban League came to take the claims of genocide seriously. In its 1990 report, The State of Black America, it stated, there is at least one concept that must be recognized if one is to see the pervasive and insidious nature of the drug problem for the African American community. Though difficult to accept that the concept of genocide, while the conspiracy theories were initially dismissed as far-fetched. So the people would tell them, Ah, uh, you're crazy. That's not true. The CIA, the government's not bringing drugs into your community. Go ahead, sir. If not downright loony, the word on the street turned out to be right, at least to, to a point. Come on. The CIA admitted in 19, 1998... In 19 what? 98. The CIA admitted in 1998 that... That guerrilla armies and actively supported the... Nic Nicaragua. Nicaragua were smuggling illegal drugs into the United States. Drugs that were making their way into the streets of inner city black neighborhoods in the form of crack cocaine. Stop. Drugs from Nicaragua, how do they wind up in our neighborhoods? They got to go past all these nice suburban neighborhoods to wind up in our neighborhoods. Why? Because we're property. Because we're not human. Because that's the narrative. And that's the narrative now. Remember, the, the computers have a bias against us. Y'all ain't hearing me. I left out Project Maven. Project Maven will scare you. Go ahead, brother. The CIA also admitted that in the midst of the war on drugs and blocked law enforcement efforts to investigate illegal drugs networks that were, help, that were helping to fund its covert war in Nica Nicaragua. 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 It bears emphasis that the CIA never admitted, nor has any evidence been revealed to support the claim that it intentionally sought to the destruction of the black community by allowing illegal drugs to smuggle into the United States. But then they show images of crack whores and crack kids and tell you blacks are so bad because they're selling drugs, but how did the drugs get there? We don't own boats. How did the guns get there? We don't have planes. Y'all with me on that? It's because Chattel property. It's because we're not considered human beings. That is the argument. That is the truth. You put that on the table. The Lord said we would be hidden prison houses. Go ahead, sir. Nonetheless, conspiracy theorists surely must be forgiven for their bold accusations of genocide in light of the devastation wrought by crack cocaine and the drug war and the odd coincidence that an illegal drug crisis suddenly appeared in the black community after, not before, a drug war had been declared. In fact, the war on drugs began at a time when illegal drug use was on the decline. Stop. The war on drugs started at a point in, in our country, or should I say, yeah, I guess we, we built it, so you're our country, that illicit drug use was on the decline. Why do you declare a war on drugs when the use of drugs is going down? Go ahead, sir. During this same time, during the same time period, however, a war was declared causing arrests and convictions for drug offenses to skyrocket, especially among people of color. Arrests. Now we're here. Hidden prison houses. Now we're here. Go ahead, sir. The impact of the drug war has been astounding. In less than 30 years, the U.S. penal population exploded from around 300,000 to more than 2 million. Stop. Penal population explosion, 300,000 to 2 million. Go ahead. With drug convictions accounting for the majority of the increase, the United States now has the highest rate of incarceration in the world. Stop. 
Go ahead. Dwarfing the rates of nearly every developed country, even surpassing those in highly repressive regions like Russia, China, and Iran. We got more imprisonment than Russia, China, and Iran. Go ahead, bro. In Germany, 93, people are in prison for every 100,000 adults and children. In the United States, the rate is roughly eight times that, or 750 per 100,000. Come on. The racial dimension of mass incarceration in its most striking feature, no other country in the world in imprisons so many of its racial or ethnic minorities. Stop. No other country in the world imprisons so many people that are racially diverse, hid in prison houses. These are the stats. This is the truth. Go ahead, sir. The United States imprisons a large percentage of its black population than South Africa did at the height of apartheid. Apartheid. Let me break that down. At the height of apartheid in South Africa, the United States still imprisons more black people than South African apartheid did. Hid in prison houses. Go ahead, brother. In Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, is it's estimated that, there, that three out of four young black men and nearly all of those in the poorest neighborhoods can expect to serve time in prison. Three out of four of us will serve time in prison. I had to bail out a couple of times. <laughs> no, seriously. Go ahead, bro. Similar rates of incarceration can be found in black communities across America. Across where? America. Come on. These stark racial disparities cannot be explained by rates of drug crime. Studies show that people of all color use and sell illegal drugs at remarkably similar rates. So everybody uses drugs. Why do we have the highest? Why is three out of four of us Three out of four of us. Go ahead, brother. If there are significant differences in the surveys to be found, they frequently suggest that whites, particularly white youth, are more likely to engage in drug crimes than people of color. Come on, brother. That is not what one world guess. However, when entering our nation's prisons and jails, which are overflowing with black and brown drug offenders, in some states, black men have been admitted to prison on drug charges in rates 20 to, 5, 20 to 50 times greater than those of white men. Stop. 20 to 50 times greater. 20 to 50 times. When the Lord says hid in prison houses, if you think he's playing with us, he's not. The stats back it up. 20 to 50 times. Three out of four black men are going to go to prison. Y'all ain't hearing me. All behind... Wood and stone, guys of wood and stone. Go ahead, my brother. And in major cities, racked by the drug wars, as many as 80% of young African American men now have criminal records and are thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. For the rest of their what? Lives. Come on. These young men are part of a growing undercast, permanently locked up and locked out of mainstream society. That's it. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you another law. I'm showing you laws. There's a concept called redlining. Has anyone ever heard of redlining? Redlining is when you're denied property because of your skin color. I'm sorry, your heritage. I'll say skin color. Hit them with the redlining, man. Let them know what we're dealing with. Go ahead, brother. Wikipedia. Redlining. In the United States, redlining is a systematic denial of various services to residents of specific, often racially associated neighborhoods or communities, either directly or through the selective raising of prices. Through the, so, so either they will directly prevent you from coming in or they'll price you out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is redlining. Go ahead, sir. While the best known examples of redlining have involved denial of financial services such as banking or insurance. Other services such as healthcare or even supermarkets have been denied to residents. In the case of retail businesses like supermarkets, proposably locating and practically far away from said residents result in a redlining effect. Have you ever wondered why we don't have massive, we don't have the same, there's, a, there's not a whole fools in the hood, y'all. Mm -hmm. right. You ever wonder That's right. why? Mm -hmm. That's why. That's it. Go to the next uh, reference, sir, inside of here. Two. 
Give me that, please. They need to know. Although informal discrimination and segregation had existed in the United States, the specific practice no, called... No, not that. I'm sorry. Let me see. Curveball. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the effect of redlining. Laws. Racism are attached to laws. Prejudice is just a change of mind. Racism, you need legislation to change. This is another law. Go ahead, sir. As a consequence of redlining, neighborhoods that local banks deem unfit or investments were left underdeveloped or in despair. Attempts to improve these neighborhoods with even relatively small-scale businesses ventures were commonly obstructed by financial institutions that, con that continued to label the underwritings as too risky or simply rejected them outright. So if you wonder why our neighborhoods look like they do without the stores and everything else, it's because of the redlining practice. When it says everyone's going to get up high, it means that. When you go out there and you wonder why our neighborhoods are the way, this way, that's because there is no resources being allotted to certain areas because of the demographic, meaning black folks. Go ahead, brother. When existing businesses collapsed, new ones were not allowed to replace them often leaving entire blocks empty and crumbling. Consequently, African Americans in those neighborhoods were frequently limited in their access to banking, health care, retail merchandise, and even groceries. Redlining paralyzed the housing market. Redlining did what? Paralyzed the housing market. Come on. Lower property values in certain areas and encouraged landlords' abandonment. As abandonments increased, the population density became lower. Abandonment buildings served as havens for drug dealings and other illegal activity. Remember those drug dealings that came from the CIA bringing drugs into our community because the banks wouldn't loan any money to have the community built up? Right. Systemic racism. Go ahead, sir. Increasing social problems and reluctance of people to invest in these areas because areas were redlined, residents in them were unable to obtain loans to improve their homes or get loans to move to a different area. Come on. Obviously, the neighborhoods had zero investments while neighborhoods around them improved. When the GI Bill was created during World War II... Now, we're talking about the GI Bill. A lot of people bought houses off the GI Bill nowadays, but let me show you something. Go ahead, bro. Veterans who once lived in redlined areas were unable to get zero interest loans to build new homes like the rest of the returning soldiers. So if you were of a certain heritage group and you were a soldier and you had the GI Bill, you couldn't buy a house. You couldn't build a house because of your demographic, while others who fought in the same war as you could do what they want. Go ahead, sir. This forced them to stay in the areas that were poor and, and uninvested in while the rest of America was growing and moving to the suburbs. <laughs> Around the same time the GI Bill was created, the Federal Highway Act was also created. Federal Highway Act, pay attention to this. You're going to love this. Go ahead. Because the areas that were redlined were so poor, many cities chose to destroy these areas to create the highways. So they took, they took the Federal Highway Act, crushed prosperous black neighborhoods with the freeways. It's called eminent domain. They will take your house, offer you less because your house is not worth anything because there aren't any, is no, there's no money to circulate in your neighborhood anyway. They bring the highway in, demolish it. And now, every, every, next thing you know, black people are scattered all over the place again, displaced again. The psychosis is real. We can't find no ease where we at. Y'all ain't hearing me. Go ahead, brother. The residents were displaced and forced to move into different uninvested neighborhoods while their homes and businesses were destroyed by the highways. So if you set up a business or you had a house that was almost paid off that you could pass down to your children's children's children, it's gone now. You got to start all over again. Your business, you got to start all over again because they demolished it. Now, is there a psychosis, a legitimate psychosis based on all of this stuff that we read? I'm cool, brother. Thank you. Yeah. Y'all with me on that? Do we now have the facts to deal with people unemotionally and intelligently with discourse and engagement? Can we talk the talk now? Not only can we deal with them outside the book, we can deal with them inside the book. 
That's what I'm trying to get to the point where I can deal with you intellectually and I can deal with you intellectually inside this book. Y'all hearing me? Now, here's the cure. <laughs> We're here now. <laughs> Go to Deuteronomy 30. <laughs> now that I've depressed you, <laughs> stuff, brother. praise the most high. On top of all that stuff, we got lynched in the middle of that going on. We still getting lynched today. Trayvon Martin was a lynching. Trayvon Martin was a lynching. Okay? Marquis McLaughlin, that was a lynching. That stand your ground stuff, you think that ain't for you? You think that ain't for me? D.W. Griffin told him how to treat me. He said, all I want to do is run around and rape white women. Of course they're going to make stand your ground. Come on, man. All you got to do is show that pistol, and it's a wrap. It's done. Mm -hmm. I ain't going to even say what I was going to say in my head. <laughs> Sometimes you can stop a whole lot of stuff by just showing up with a pistol, and I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> right? <laughs> Pop the trunk. It's like, okay. Matter of fact, all you got to do is show them rounds sometimes, but I digress. Deuteronomy 30. Here's the cure to the psychosis. We didn't heard it before. We're going to hear it again, Jack. Here's the cure to the psychosis. Here's how we come out of it. Deuteronomy 30, we're going 1 through 7. Go ahead, my brother. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are, are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God have driven thee. Stop. First step. We need to be banging, talking about this. We need to be telling people about this. This is what the Lord said. Once we get scattered, what we have to do to start the healing process is tell everybody about these curses and these blessings. Now we can do it intellectually, and we can do it, we can mix and match. You got to be a cage fighter. That's the first step. Tell everybody about these curses and blessings. Then what? Go ahead, sir. Then... And, 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 and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I commanded thee this day. Thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. We have to return to God, us, and our children, and not play no games. We got to tell everybody about the blessings and the curses, and we have to follow God with all of our heart and stop playing. Go ahead, brother. That then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations. Just from Europe. All the nations. Just from Russia. All the nations. All nations. We're in all nations. So-called Jews, Europe. Us, the children of Israel, the real Jews, all nations. Go ahead, sir. Whither the Lord thy God have scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the, out, the outmost parts of heaven from thence, will the Lord thy God gather thee and from thence will he fetch thee. Come on. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. This is after the wilderness of the people when the people are purged. When we're purged in the wilderness of the people, we're going to have some act right. Go ahead, sir. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies. Stop. So all the curses that we dealt with, if people don't get no act right, they're going to get the curses. Go ahead, sir. And on them that hate thee, which persecute thee. Now listen, I know it sounds like a revolution and acting crazy and getting out in the streets is the answer, but we are outnumbered and outgunned. The fight is the Lord's. So let me show you what the Lord is going to do on behalf of us. Psalm 83. Put a marker on, in Deuteronomy 30. I ain't telling you to put on some white gloves and yes, a boss. I'm telling you, use your mind. I am not telling you to yes, a boss, because I sure ain't no yes, a boss. I'm an intellectual wolverine. I don't play with them. The fight is the Lord's. This is not to hate anyone. This is to give you the, the facts. Psalm 83. 
We're going 13 through 17. This is the cure for our psychological issues. This is what the Lord is going to do for his children. Go ahead, sir. Oh, my God, make them like a wheel as the stubble before the wind. The them is our enemies. Go ahead, sir. As the fire burneth the wood, and as the flame set it, set it the mountains on fire. Come on. So persecute them with thy, tremble, thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. Come on. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thy name, O Lord. Stop. You see why he wants to fill... It's not to hate anybody. It's so they will seek his name. This whole thing is so everyone will seek the name of the Lord and follow him. It's not, oh, white people, blah, 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 or other nations, or Arabs, or this or that. He said, fill their faces with shame that they may seek thy name. Go ahead, sir. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yeah, let them be put to shame and perish. Back to Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30, we're going 8 through 10. We'll deal with that in Q&A. Deuteronomy 30, 8 through 10. But that's probably not an argument that someone would want to come with. Deuteronomy 30, 8 through 10. Let's get back to the cure. It ain't about hating other nations. The other nations did not, they furthered the affliction according to the word. They furthered the affliction. But I'm here to tell you, it's our fault. But I'll never tell a white supremacist that. I will not help him punch me in the face. Deuteronomy 30, we're going 8 through 10. Someone that really wants to know about the condition, not a problem. Someone that wants to impute and reinforce the, uh, the stigma, no, not at all. I'm going to give them the facts. Deuteronomy 30, we're going 8 through 10. Deuteronomy 30, 8 through 10. Go ahead, my brother. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. Come on. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the, of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the, of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. We're talking about an overall change of heart and mind regarding obedience to God's word. That's the only choice that we have to get out of this. And this is necessary to move forward as a people and a nation. We got to change our perception of ourselves and how we respond to each other, and we must respect one another. We have to respect each other. And we must not assist nor perpetuate the negative and psychologically debilitating narrative about so-called black people coming from the construct. I am not going to help them punch me in my face anymore. Now let's go to Nehemiah 9. Y'all with me on that? Let's not help them punch us in the face. Let's not, let's not perpetuate what they created and assigned to us. I repudiate that. I am not a maniac rapist that just wants to run around and lie and steal and I'm lazy. No. That's not me. That's not my people. How can we be the laziest people on the planet when we worked for 245 years for free? But we're the laziest people, but we're the ones who work those fields because no one else had the... No one else had the strength to work those fields. Nah, I refuse. I'm not going for it. Nehemiah 9, we're going 32 through 38. This is the cure. This is the cure. Nehemiah 9, 32 through 38. Go ahead, bro. Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the terrible God, who keep his covenant in mercy, let not all the trouble seem little before thee, that has come upon us, on our kings, on our, on our princes, and on our priests, and on our prophets, and on our fathers, and on all thy people, since the time of the king of Assyria unto this day. Come on. Howbeit thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. 33 again. This is the mindset. 
I can't blame the white man. The white man is about business. For him, this was just business. And it's still about business. If you ever read the preamble of the United States, this construct is not made for you and I. It is made for them to give them and their children an advantage over everyone. It's business. But I'm not going to let them pump me. I'm going to put it on the table and let them know what time it is. But it was us who did wrong. Read 33 again, brother. This is the mindset we got to have. Humility. Go ahead, sir. Albeit thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for thou that has done right, but we have done wickedly. Come on. And neither have our kings, our, pri our princes, our priests, nor our fathers ke kept thy law. Stop. Nobody kept the law. None of our ancestors kept the law. That's why we're here. That's why we're in Colombia. That's why we're all over the place. That's why we're in Brazil. That's why we're in Russia. Pushkin was an Israelite. Pushkin was an Israelite. Y'all ain't hearing me. Go ahead, my brother. Nor hearken unto thy commandments and thy testimonies wherewith thou didst testify against them. For they have not served thee in their kingdom and in thy great goodness that thou gavest them and in the large and fat land. A large and fat land. That sounds like the place I want to be, a large and fat land. When they say you live in fat, where that come from? Mm -hmm. Yo, man, I'm living fat right now. The Bible, family, y'all ain't hearing me. This is written by us. I guess y'all in perpetual shock right now for the curses, huh? <laughs> y'all being traumatized right now, huh? <laughs> Go ahead, my brother. Fat land which thou gavest before them, neither turn they from their wicked works. Come on. Behold, we are servants this day, and for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat, the fruit thereof, and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it, and it, and it yielded much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Come on. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure and we are in great distress. Do y'all hear what you just read? You just read should tell slavery. You just read drugs coming into in your, in your community. You just read it again. This is after we came out the second or third, second iteration. This is after we came out the second Babylonian iteration, iteration, which means uh, a version of our slavery. But this is still for today. Go ahead, sir. Now, 38. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it. And our, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. This is what we have to do to God. We got to come back and stop playing. And let me show you something. The first step is to keep the Sabbaths. Plural, S. The first step is to keep the Sabbaths. I'm going to show you all how we can stop the murder rate over the weekend in Chicago with one failed swoop. 95%. Go to Exodus 20. Sabbath. There's no one to shoot in the streets if someone is inside doing what this says to do. This is how we get our mind right. This is why we're here. We want to stop the murder rate? Exodus 20, 8 through 11. This is what I'm going to say. I'm going to go on record saying this. I guarantee you, no Israelite that is really keeping the law, statutes, and judgments is out there shooting somebody. The Sabbath is the solution to that. Go ahead, sir. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. To keep it what? Holy. Polluted. Holy. By ourselves. Holy. Cook something. <laughs> Go ahead. Holy. Talk business. Holy. Go ahead. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath day but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest of the But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and it thou shalt not do any work. Some work. Any work. I got a gig I gotta do. No work. My boss told me I gotta come in. No work. I'm just making excuses because I want some money. No work. No work. Here, we don't play. Other camps, they may tell you it's cool, they may dance around it. Here, I'm gonna tell you, don't work on the Sabbath. This is the solution. Go ahead, brother. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. If you got a business, shut your business down. You ain't supposed to have employees working on the Sabbath, neither. 
That's why I can't do a lot of the businesses that I thought or think to do because of that stipulation right there. And I'm not going to equivocate with it. 11, my brother. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them it is, and rested the seventh, the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. If we keep the Sabbath as a nation, I guarantee the violence that we deal with will go down 95%. I will go on camera. Don't never put me on CNN because that's all I'll say over and over again. We need to keep the Sabbath. Let's go back to Nehemiah. Let me show you how to keep the Sabbath. This is why I did no Sabbath disclaimer today. We're dealing with the Sabbath right now. This is the first step. This is how you get your mind right. The first thing that goes out the window is a person not keeping the Sabbath. I guarantee you. Nehemiah 13. We keep the Sabbath. That's part of the cure. That's how we wind up learning. That's how we wind up telling people about these blessings and curses. And that's how we stop being treated as chattel property. Chattel is over, but we still treat it as property. Y'all ain't hearing me. Y'all, see, the problem is we think we're free. We think we're free. We're not free. We're still in captivity. Chattel slavery is done. We're still in captivity. We're still viewed like this. Nehemiah 13, this is how we get out of this. This is how we fix our minds. Nehemiah 13, we're going 15 through 22. Nehemiah 13, 15 through 22. Go ahead, brother. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves, and, and lading asses, as also wines, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. This is called work. Don't work. Don't buy or sell. Don't do any business transactions. This is how we properly keep the Sabbath. We keep it holy. Go ahead, sir. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of, of ware and sold on the Sabbath. They're out of pocket. Go ahead, brother unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Come on. Then I contended with the noble of, Ju of Judah and said unto them, what evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? To buy and sell on the Sabbath is evil. Point blank, the scripture just said it, it's evil. This is why we wound up over here speaking English, fighting over all this silly stuff. Go ahead, sir. Did not your father thus and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning, by profaning the Sabbath. Come on. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath. Now, here we're here. The Sabbath starts when it's dark. Let's not argue over slivers of sunlight, red and everything. It says the gates began to be shut when it began to be dark before the Sabbath. Sunset, when it's dark, that's when the Sabbath starts. It's dark to light. That's how God's days start. No more is arguing over this. We got bigger fish to fry. Go ahead, sir. I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be open till after the Sabbath. Come on. And some of my servants said, said I at the gates that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. In other words, he's like, ain't nobody coming up in here to do nothing. Or like you say in the streets, natron. Go ahead, brother. So the merchants and sellers of all kinds of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. He gave him two times to just hang out at them gates. They got two times. Go ahead, brother. Then I testified against them and said unto them, why lodge ye about the wall? If ye do so again, I will lay hands on you. Stop. Is he talking about giving somebody a hug? <laughs> He's talking about a two-piece dark spicy with rice, right? A pumpkin head in Chicago, right? SOS, serve on site. He's talking about <laughs> banging them out if they come here again. This is the attitude we got to have when it comes to the Sabbath, right? We got to be prep, prepared, and not play. This is the first step to us coming out of this. Go ahead, sir. From that time forth, came they no more on the Sabbath. <laughs> yeah, you got some brothers telling you I'm going to sock you in the face. Yeah, that's good to listen to. Go ahead, brother. And I commanded the Levites 
that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Come on. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. Now, in addition to us coming back to our God, keeping the Sabbath properly, we got to control the narrative by presenting ourselves with dignity. We got to bring the dignity back. Martin Luther King had the dignity cracking. He's in three-piece suits getting bombed on. Y'all ain't hearing me. We have to control the narrative. We got to bring it back. Deuteronomy 7. We got to remember who we are. I know we've been told by scientists that we're less than human and, we've been, and we're property, but we're God's children. When God walked the earth, he looked like us directly. We are the caretakers of the world. We need to take care of ourselves. Control the narrative. I refuse for someone to, to, to think that I'm a buffoon. I absolutely refuse. They're going to get all these words that I paid $500 for 200, 20 years ago. Real talk. We got to control the narrative and carry ourselves with dignity. You know why? Because God told us to. Verse 6, give me 6 through 9, brother. Deuteronomy 7, give me 6 through 9. Control the narrative. For Go thou, ahead. For thou art, art and a holy people. Stop. He said we're a holy people. We're not whores. We're not pimps. We're not drug dealers. We're not maniacs. We're not murderers. We're holy people. Go ahead, brother. Unto the Lord thy God. Start at six again, please. But for thou art an holy people, unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So instead of us being on the bottom, we're supposed to be at the top. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, sir. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. We're the smallest out of everybody on the earth. It wasn't our size that the Lord was dealing with. Go ahead. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Go ahead. Had the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Come on. Know therefore that the Lord, thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenants and mercies with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Stop. To a thousand generations. To a thousand generations. The Lord made promises to us, and these are going to stand for a thousand generations. We are holy people, y'all. We control the narrative. Now, I'm going to go on record with an oldie but goodie and say the Sabbath is so important, this is the one thing that would have kept us in the land. I'm going to take you back to a time when we was in our land, we was calling on whatever name God was, we had the fringes, we had the outfits, we had the sacrifice, we had the Pharisees, we had all that stuff. I'm going to show you what the Lord, no, we didn't have the Pharisees at this point, but we had everything that was conducive to our success. And this is what the Lord told us. Go to Jeremiah 17. The Sabbath is important. We can argue over everything else we want to argue over, but I'm going to tell you what the Lord told us. Jeremiah 17, 21 through 27. The Sabbath would have kept us in the land. Not no outrageous outfits, not no language, none of that. The Sabbath, the one thing that's so simple, would have kept us there. I wouldn't have been Chattel property wouldn't have been making no movies about me played by white men in blackface. Jeremiah 17, 21 through 27. We should have just listened. Go ahead, brother. Thus said the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day. Neither do ye any work. Some work. Any work. Some work. Any work. I got to do something. No work. Come on. But hollow ye the Sabbath day, as I commanded your fathers. Come on, brother. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff, that they might not hear, nor receive instruction. Come on. And it shall come to pass, if ye diligently hearken unto me, saith the Lord, to bring in no burden 
through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hollow the Sabbath day to do no work therein. Some work. No work. I got a bill coming up, and if I do this quick thing, then I can get paid, and then I can pay the bill, and then I won't have a problem. No work. Come on. Then shall there enter into the gates of the city kings and princes, sitting upon the thrones of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, the men of Judah, and the inhabitation of Jerusalem and this city shall remain forever. I don't think you understand what we just read. If you keep the Sabbath, I will keep everyone away from you and your leaders, your kings, your princes, and, your, and you will stay here. He said the Sabbath. He didn't say nothing other than the Sabbath. I'm not arguing over all the other stuff. I'm not saying it's not important. What I'm saying is this. We got bigger fish to fry. Go ahead, my brother. And they shall come from the cities of Judah and from the places about Jerusalem and from the land of Benjamin and from the plain and from the mountains and from the south, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices and meat offerings and incense and bringing sacrifices of praise unto the house of the Lord. Come on. But if ye will not hearken unto me to hollow the Sabbath day and not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates of thereof, and it shall devour the places of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. That's why he said we're set on fire and we don't even consider because we didn't keep the Sabbath, which is the first step. Let's go to Isaiah 35, y'all. We almost out of here. This is the longest lesson I've ever done. Yes, sir. <laughs> Good stuff. You're welcome. You're welcome, Caleb. Isaiah 35. One verse. To all my brothers and sisters in the struggle. We got a psychosis, but we got a cure for it. We got a way out of it. Here's what the Lord has to say to us. Isaiah 35, verse 4. Go ahead, brother. Say to them that fear of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Last verse, Jeremiah 32. I'm going to do a more comprehensive lesson called the cost of the curses. Why well, get into the financial aspect? That's another part of the solution. We need equity. We need equity. 245 years later, give me mine. That comes at a later date. This is what the Lord has to say. When he says he's going to come and get us, if you don't believe it, Jeremiah 32, one verse, 27. Go ahead, bro. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Is it anything too hard for God to do? No. In conclusion, read your Bibles, pray to the Lord for understanding, and keep yourselves from sin. And I hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name. We welcome you and hope today's lesson increased your knowledge of the Holy Bible. CDs and DVDs of the Sabbath lessons are available. Please place your order and donations in an offering envelope and it will be filled on the next Sabbath. The children's class ages five through 12 start at the same time of the Sabbath lesson in the assigned location. Bring your child so that their knowledge may be increased. Train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22 and six. Adult question and answer is from 4.30 to 6.30 after the Sabbath lesson. We have question and answer every Wednesday at 5 p.m. via telephone conference line. The number and access code are located at the top of the lesson. Or see the live stream of question and answer at www.thykingdomcom7.com. If you are interested in being baptized, please place your name on the list at the literature table. Remember to follow the dress code. When attending our services, men should remove all hats and all head coverings during service times. Women should wear a head covering such as a hat or scarf during the service. Women should not wear tight-fitting pants or skirts or revealing clothing. Attire should be modest according to the Bible. If you or your child become restless during the Bible lesson, we encourage you to remove your child from the room until he or she is settled, or you and your child can watch the service from a family room.
Your tithes and offerings are always appreciated. Please place your tithes and offerings in an offering envelope and deposit it in the offering box. Your cooperation is greatly appreciated. Again, thank you for coming, and we hope to see you on the next Sabbath. Peace. Peace.